After spending years on the New York Comedy Club circuit, John Stewart was rewarded with his own talk show on MTV. That led to a syndicated late night show with Paramount. Although it was canceled after less than a year, Stewart's career has hardly suffered. Is a deal to develop a television program with Letterman's Worldwide Pants Company, a deal to develop film projects with Miramax, and will guest host Tom Snyder's Late Late Show next week. Joining me now, John Stewart. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have to be you here. here. You grew up in New Jersey, did you? Yeah, I grew up right outside of Trenton, a place yeah. called Lawrenceville. And, and, and your brother, the story you tell, yes. was the smartest, coolest. He's the smartest, smartest of whip. Yeah, and so you said, and you said, I'm going to go for laughs. This is a better way for me to find yeah. my place. Yeah. yeah. Well, he came, I, I, I always remember, he went to uh, the Lawrenceville Prep School, which was a... It's a big, uh, classy prep school. Exactly. Very classy all-boys school. And I went to uh, the public school. I remember coming home one day, and he had won uh, a silver cup. Yeah. for uh, being good in Latin. <laughs> and I just thought, you know what, man, I'm done. Yeah. I'm never going to get it. I'm never, I know no matter what I do academically, I'm not getting a cup. This, this is an early sign. Exactly. And so, so you said, what the hell, I'll go to exactly. New York and hang out and be funny. That's exactly How, right. And what do you learn from that when you come and you go to Caroline's and the Comedy Club and all these places that are in this city and in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. How do you break in? Give me a sense of the process. You know, there's not... People wonder about that and that there's like a whole, uh, you have to train for six months before you first. The process is, is really about... Making people laugh. Making people laugh and unleashing your inhibitions. And then it's it sort of, you graduate through various stages of it. You know, it starts out, the first night is usually uh, one in which you summon up all your courage. It's something you've sort of had in the back of your mind for a very long time. I want to get up there. I want to tell some jokes. Uh, my first night was at the bitter end in New York City. Uh, mostly because of its storied history, you know, Woody Allen was there, Bill Cosby, all these wonderful comedians. The night I was there, uh, they had, of course, been long gone. And it was, you know, uh, a bunch of open mic bands followed by, at 1 yeah. o'clock in the morning, open mic comedians. Uh, and you just have a couple of beers, and you go out there, and you do your thing, and you stink, and you try and step there as long as you can. But then it's, then it's about learning what you're yeah. supposed to be doing on the stage. But it's, it's one of those jobs that you have to learn while you're up there. You can't hold, you know, a... Uh, uh, a hairbrush in your hand and stand next to the mirror and think you're going to learn about doing yeah. comedy. It's, it's got to be an audience. It has to be the real thing. It has to be on the job. It's a little bit like people say you can't play the stock market on paper. It never no, works. No, no. Everybody always does great when they're just <laughs> picking them, you know, yeah. and then when you go in there and it's real money. And that's what it is with comedy. You just have to, there's no magic formula to it. Do you think people either have it, an instinct for it, or don't, you know? For example, somebody, I just did a long interview, not for television, right. but for a live audience, with Jonathan Miller the great stage director, right. was part of Beyond the Fringe, clearly has a genius for directing sure. and for comedy. He said that he can spot great actors. They have some capacity for mimic. No, I believe that's true. You know, great comedians have what? There, there's some what instinct they have? Uh, an enormous capacity for attention. <laughs> uh, I, I think the capacity is that your mind functions in a certain way where you see the absurdity of nearly everything that you survey. And, and yeah. in that way, I tried working various jobs where you're not supposed to use the absurdity that you see, yeah. where you're supposed to actually do what you're told, and I couldn't do it. And I think that this was the first place where I, I, the first job that I have where even when I was terrible at it, and even when I would do it and the audience wouldn't respond, where I felt comfortable, where yeah. I felt comfortable in my own skin and comfortable in, in what I was doing. And in that sense, but you do get better. There is a process where you learn. It's not... You're not born a comedian and you go out there and sure, of course. the first night they go, my God, he's a genius. Yeah. I mean, not everybody is Jerry. Jerry Seinfeld wasn't Jerry Seinfeld when he started. No, but he probably thought like Jerry Seinfeld <laughs> at that time and just worked yeah. on it and, and found the essence of how he thought and developed that. Yeah. He and Leno yeah. love it to this day. Doing stand-up. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to both of them. And they just, Leno even goes out and... They and still, it that way. yeah, no. I at that point, I think once my uh, my yearly salary hits around seven million, <laughs> I don't work weekends at that point. No more. Yeah, yeah. I think on weekends perhaps I garden, perhaps I swim, <laughs> yeah, perhaps yeah. But or I don't maybe know chess. that I, I don't know that I still get on a plane and fly to Kalamazoo <laughs> to entertain the Legion. And why do they do it? Uh, I wish I knew. It's not money. You know what? There's a certain workaholism to this business that you're never free from it. Yeah. You never have a moment where you're free from it. Yeah. And I imagine that they love that so much. And there is something about your stand-up that's different from doing a talk show or doing a, a sitcom that's much more freeing, where you can go up there and if you have just a silly thought that morning, you can go up there and say <laughs> yeah. it that night and, and hopefully it works out. 
but man, God bless him, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could answer that. Because Letterman says, or said here, mm -hmm. that for him it was just passing through. I mean, he was on his right. way somewhere. Yeah. You know, it was not something that he was driven to do. Yeah, I don't know that he maybe enjoyed his time as a stand-up as much as maybe Leno or Seinfeld did, and maybe w w wasn't as much of a craftsman as those two guys are, and maybe yeah. that's really where their love is, and it just so happens that brought them to another place where they're making their money. I mean, it's not the kind of life I think you want to lead in your 40s and your 50s if that's all you're doing. I don't think you want to be the Willie Loman of comedy, where you're just out there with the suitcase <laughs> yeah. and you're walking into each town and you're opening up and you're going, I got some jokes. You know, I think that's a tough place to be, but yeah. I love stand-up. I started doing it, and hopefully I will always be able to do it throughout my, you know, my career. Maybe not every weekend. But and when you do it, mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, are you constantly bringing in new material, or can you get by constantly. with the same material? Charlie, for... I am writing as we speak. <laughs> it's something going I on back there. I must produce hours. And, no, I wish. It took me no, ten years to come up with an hour. You get up in the morning I and you get play up in games. The morning, I get up and I play games. <laughs> and you theater. go to the theater. Uh, Where are going to bring that up? <laughs> I, uh, uh, you, you do write, but it doesn't. It's not, man. It's not constant yeah. uh, for me. Yeah. But then again, you know, for other guys. I mean, but, people like Dennis Miller, like George Carlin, who are prolific. Yeah. and great at that. I think probably write a little bit more. The rest of us are trying to bang mm. out that one hour. It's not like the old days at Vaudeville where 20 minutes got you through your life. You know. are, there, are there, if we look back at people like Lenny Bruce. Sure. Mort Saul is still around. Right. I think I know what you're going for. Jews. All Jews, Charlie, and I think that brings up an interesting point. We're a funny, funny people. <laughs> no. <laughs> Richard Pryor. Is Richard Pryor Jewish? Uh, he's got a little, a little bit, of, a little bit, exactly. a little bit of a kosher in him. Yeah, it, is that kind of stuff popular today? I mean, a kind of biting political satire. Is what's what's I, I think happening? Bruce is and, it different and, than it was? I guess I'm asking. I believe it's different than it was because it's uh, it's more <laughs> difficult to shock people. It's more yeah. difficult to do something that hasn't been done. Um, when you look at Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor, they were blowing people's minds. I don't know that a comedian at this point could really blow people's minds politically and socially. Uh, the closest we probably have to it are, are Dennis Miller, again, Chris right, Rock, right, right, Chris uh, Rock. Carlin. Um, but it's a different scenario. Even if you look at, you know, George Carlin had the bit, seven words you couldn't say on television. Well, now you can say them on television. It's, it's harder and harder to find that You just can't say them on radio. You can't say them on <laughs> radio. Howard's turn. Exactly. Yeah, Howard's not allowed to say them on radio now. As the taboos fall, it's very difficult to find, you know, no one's going to prosecute you. No, there's going to be no more dirty Lenny. Because yeah. Dirty Lenny could work everywhere, you know, instead of yeah. two cities and, and, and... Do you think most people look at, at stand-up and comedy and who are doing it and thinking, I really want to be Eddie Murphy in the movies. I really want to be Jerry Seinfeld on a sitcom. I think a lot I of really people want to be David Letterman with a talk show. They're sure. For, and that's a payday. I think a lot of people are looking for a big payday, but the same percentage of people that did it for uh, the love of it are doing it for the love of it now. It's just, I think, a yeah. larger and pool. Why is it that stand-up comedians are so good at these th at situation comedies, whether it's Bill Cosby all the right. way up to, to, to Ellen, to Roseanne, right. to da 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 You've got to understand, to, to be really well, good understand. at this, to be really, I can't believe, I'm, you know, you just talked to Sharonsky, and now I'm actually trying to talk seriously to you. You're talking to, like, dissidents that spent years in prison, yeah, exactly. you know, drinking a good uh, show, wasn't salt it? water. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> now I'm sitting here like... Charlie, let me explain something to you. <laughs> Comedy is an art form. That... You no, know, no, I'm not asking that. No, no, I mean, what is, why is it that, that we're, primetime television is populated by former stand-up comedians? Because they spend years and years on the road boiling down their essences and working on their characters on stage and working yeah. on timing and, and knowing what feels right coming out of their mouth so that it seems natural. Roseanne takes a show that's a wonderful extension of who she was on stage. And man, she, she knew every aspect of that show and how she wanted it from spending all those nights on stage developing who she was. You know, same to Tim Allen. So, the, so, so each of those characters are an extension of what they had created I, I on believe stage. so. And I also believe, though, that if they did something that wasn't an extension of what they created on stage, it would be great. Because they understand why things are funny for them. You know. Let's assume that I come to you and I am uh, a network television president. All right. Okay. A leap now, this of... is before or after I hit you. <laughs> this is after you hit me. This is a leap of faith. Now, mm -hmm. you, you, you have signed a deal with Worldwide Pants, with Letterman's right. company, to create some kind of show that will come into being right. at some time. Right. Okay. I assume it's tailored to a certain time period. Yes. All right. 
The time it, in between his show ends and sunrise semester begins. <laughs> Six hour block. Yeah. I used to be on at that hour. No, you were. <laughs> yes, I was. Oh, uh, got up. Uh, and so, what is it? You, what would you create for yourself if you could create? Would it be any different than what you have done before, or has there been some in kind of in terms of like a long form, like yeah, a sitcom form? No, no. Like in that? terms of a talk show, that's what you're creating, I assume. I know you're doing yeah. the movies and you're doing right, the, right. the other stuff, um, and you're a regular on Larry Sanders and all that. I think that I, I would I, try and, and continue in what we tried to do with MTV and with Paramount, which was. To create a show that had a certain sense of spontaneity, it's, you know, you, you're never, I think, at this point, going to do a talk show, again, that's going to blow people's mind, that people are going to watch and go, my God, look what he has pulled out of the cast of Family Matters. You know, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. It's, it's not. The, 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 the grist for that mill has already been, been run over, so I think all you can do is set up a, a somewhat different atmosphere. And my atmosphere, like on the old show, was incredibly unprepared. Yeah. And I think that worked for Incredibly us. unprepared. Exactly. <laughs> it, I, I think the spontaneity is, is something that, that we enjoyed on our show because, A, we didn't have much money. We didn't have a lot of prep time. We tried to yeah. throw everything together at once. And, and I'm just too scared ourselves. to be unprepared. Is that true? Oh, yeah. But you're, you're what's known as in the business as professional. <laughs> See, that's the difference between you and that's I. That's true. That's, yeah. You are known as actually a very professional interviewer, <laughs> yeah. and I'm known as that guy who showed up at 7 with vodka on his breath. <laughs> but um, see, you just compare your paycheck with mine. Exactly. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I have a fake wood table. <laughs> you have a real wood table. Exactly. Think, uh, uh, and the thing. Miramac movie deal, what's that about? Uh, that's about... What's that about, movie star? That's, man, <laughs> I wish. It's, it's more about learning another avenue of... I think... Well, again, one of the things that I think stand-ups have is a versatility that I think there's a bit of a, a prejudice sometimes against stand-ups as, as being something, not being able to be something other than joke tellers. Yeah, right. But I think that most of them know how to write and how to do humor and how to develop. And, you know, of course they do. It's, uh, and, and it's sort of making a foray into a longer form. One of the things about the talk show that was difficult is it's really disposable. I mean, what's nice about it is you have an idea at 10 a.m. By 6 p.m., it's out there. Right. And if it stinks, you know it. And if it doesn't, you know it. But and, then it's and gone. And then you get up the next morning. And you get up the next day. morning. You do something else. And I think yeah. what's appealing about that is the idea to work for a year on something that will then stink. After Since a year. you're being candid, hmm. where do you think David is right now? Dave yes, Letterman. He's Dave actually Le waiting for no. me in the green room. We're going to go out. And, I think <laughs> we're going to score. I don't know yeah. what's going on. Uh, score? No. Score? No. You're no. Letterman going kidding, to score kidding, tonight? <laughs> Please, you, you paid my check. You're Please. Um, is he? Where do you think he is? In his head. In his. In his. You know, in terms of what he's doing. I'll tell you where I, I I'm serious, think he should I'm be. I'm serious, because I'm a big fan of his, as he knows. As, as I am, I think where he should be is where Johnny Carson was in his heyday, which is at a point where he can relax. Yeah. I wish. I, I feel that he's owed that. I feel like he deserves that. Uh, after 15 years of what I think were incredibly original television, I feel like he shouldn't have to be in this sort of arms race that has occurred. Uh, and it's unfortunate. And... Uh, you know, that's, that's the marketplace right now, that it's, you know, run as fast as you can, do a variety show, pedal on the thing, have the dogs flying out. You know, I, I wish he were at a place where he could take a deep breath, you know. But that's, I don't know that that's what he wants. I don't know that that's, that's just what I would think uh, he deserves. The show that you're working on. Yeah. Uh, is this going to be a show that you substitute for Tom Snyder? Yeah. And one, uh, Tom Snyder is is one of the legends of broadcasting. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. one of the great... Well, I have the opportunity to, to sort of learn what he does and learn what Dave does, and it's... it's Different. I, I consider it sort of the apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, you know, where you go out there and you, you know... <laughs> Who's afraid of Duddy? I mean, yeah, exactly. No, it's the apprenticeship of, of Duddy Kravitz. Yeah. Right? Um, who... Which will you do? I mean, will you replace Snyder no. on CBS? No. No. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm basically there... Uh, if he wants to go off on vacation for a week, I'll come in and That's I'll host the show for a week. That's what your contract says. If Tom's yeah. not there, you're in. Exactly. Um, they pay you big money to do that? Un it's amazing. I, seriously, <laughs> I should honestly have taken it and just gone to Mexico and not done anything. It's just... And lived in a little villa with, like, the Sheens. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's ridiculous at times. But... But it gives you time to do all these other things. Yeah. The Larry Sanders show yeah. where you're the yeah, guy. At this point in my life, I, I, I enjoy this. At this point in your yeah. life as if you're beyond I'm 30. I'm an old man. Look at the gray. I'm 34, for God's sakes. It's, at uh, this point in your life, what? Uh, it, it gives you a chance for the diversity that I've always had one project that I'm working on full on. And this gives me a chance to try and juggle things. Yeah. And, and 
uh, it's it's exciting for me to to be able to try that, you know, to do that. And and I also have panic. I have you know the neuroses of, but I got to have my hands in something. So it's you know it's it's that balance of setting up things that you really want to do, but also having like a little anchor that's going to pay your bills for. You know, I still go on the road. I still do a lot of shows and uh, that kind of thing. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. John Stewart, we thank you for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow night.